Dr. Jonathan McGlanchey recently complained that YouTube atheists pick on low-hanging fruit, like Dr. Gary Habermas' minimal facts, rather than more robust arguments for Jesus' resurrection. Someone asked Dr. McGlatchey what he considered to be a more robust argument. He responded by posting a link to one of his own articles. So, challenge accepted, Dr. McGlatchey. A response to your evidential contribution of Luke Acts on the resurrection of Jesus. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. This one is long, so I'm getting right into it. Dr. McClatchy begins by saying any discussion of the evidence for the resurrection must first ascertain what the original apostolic witnesses claimed and whether those claims are best explained by the resurrection or by some alternative hypothesis. The problem is we don't have that. None of the original 12 apostles wrote about what they saw to give us a first-hand account of any events of Jesus' life, let alone a resurrection. Some say the Apostle Peter wrote the epistles that bear his name, but there's two problems with that claim. First, nowhere does the author claim to have seen a resurrection. He mentions the word resurrection in 1 Peter 1.3, but says nothing about having seen such an event. The only place the author even mentions having seen Jesus is in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, where he claims to have been there at the Transfiguration. If the resurrection was in fact the greatest event in human history, and the author was an eyewitness to that event, you would think that he would at least mention that fact in a work about a faith built on that event. Second, as Bart Ehrman points out, many scholars, however, doubt that Peter wrote this letter. Virtually the only thing that we can say for certain about the disciple Peter is that he was a lower-class fisherman from Galilee who was known to have been illiterate. His native tongue was Aramaic. This letter, on the other hand, is written by a highly literate Greek-speaking Christian who is intimately familiar with the Old Testament in its Greek translation and with a range of Greek rhetorical constructions. It is possible, however, that Peter went back to school after Jesus' resurrection, learned Greek, became an accomplished writer, and mastered the Greek Old Testament, and moved to Rome before writing this letter. But to most scholars, this seems unlikely, especially since we have no evidence of anything like adult education in the ancient world. But Dr. McClatchy never claims that the original apostles wrote any of the New Testament. Rather, he looks here. The contemporary discussion of the case for the resurrection has largely focused around 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, a text believed by many scholars to represent an ancient creedal tradition that Paul had received from the Jerusalem apostles and which he passed on to the believers in Corinth. Paul's words in verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed suggests that the message Paul presented to the Corinthians is the same as that proclaimed by the Jerusalem apostles. Skipping his presentation of an argument I don't intend to make, we come to, it is understandable that Luke represents the post-resurrection encounters as involving multiple sensory modes. Jesus appears to multiple individuals at once, and those encounters are not merely visual, but are also auditory. Jesus engages the disciples in group conversation. The encounters are close up and involve physical contact. Moreover, Acts indicates that the appearances were spread out over a 40-day time period. Thus, the resurrection encounters were not one brief confusing episode. If, then, it can be shown that Luke was indeed a traveling companion of Paul, it would be quite surprising if his understanding of the apostolic claim concerning the resurrection differed essentially from that of Paul. So Dr. McGlatchy's major premise is that the author of Luke and Acts, whoever that may be, as there is no scholarly consensus on who this person is, was in fact a traveling companion of Paul. He says there is an additional reason why Luke being a traveling companion of Paul is significant in our investigation of the resurrection. 
and that is that Luke claims to have been present with Paul during Paul's visit to the Jerusalem church in Acts 21 when all the elders, including James, were present, Acts 21.18. Luke was present with Paul during his imprisonment at Caesarea Maritima for at least two years, during which time he undoubtedly would have had ample access to the many living witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, since Caesarea is only approximately 120 kilometers from Jerusalem, where many of the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection resided. I have two issues with this claim. First, that Acts 21 indicates that the elders were there when this person and Paul were in Jerusalem. It doesn't identify who these elders are by name, except for James. None of the original 12 disciples of Jesus are mentioned in the book of Acts after chapter 8, other than Peter. There is no evidence that the elders are witnesses of a resurrection. Church elders change every couple years. We have no reason to think that these elders are the same disciples that were in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost. If these elders were in fact Jesus' disciples, I would think that the author would have identified them as such, rather than referring to them as elders. If Peter was still there and is the source of Paul's knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, this is not ample access to many living witnesses, but rather just one witness. Dr. McClatchy says that these witnesses are in Jerusalem while Paul is in Caesarea for two years, only 120 kilometers, or about 75 miles, for those of us who don't live where more reasonable units of measure are used. Is this really unfettered access that Dr. McClatchy claims it to be? I live in Huntsville, Alabama, about 75 miles from the northern parts of the city of Birmingham. I can tell you for a fact that I do not have ample access to the knowledge of what the people in Birmingham may have seen or heard. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church is a major event that occurred in Birmingham when I was a young child. I have been to Birmingham to see the Civil Rights Museum to learn about these events. I have read about it in displays in the museum and in a book written by an eyewitness. But all the times that I have been to Birmingham, you know what I have never heard? Anyone tell me that they personally witnessed this event. I have no doubt that at some point I may have come in contact with or even talked to someone who was a witness to this. But since I have no way of knowing who is and who isn't a witness, I have no idea who to ask. And no, random people on the street don't come up and talk to me about it. Travel to Birmingham is easy for me. I get in my car and I can be there in 90 minutes. For the author of Luke to travel 75 miles is about a four day journey. So the fact that Jerusalem is a mere 75 miles away does not mean that the author of Luke had ample access to witnesses to a resurrection. And it's not like they had cell phones where they could just call and ask. And even if they did, this is very like the claim that Jesus appeared to 500 and anyone living in the first century need only talk to them to verify the claim. Except where are these 500 witnesses? Who are they? Here, at least we know where they are supposed to be, in Jerusalem. But we still don't know who they are, the elders that Paul met when he arrived there. Again, nothing in the text indicates that any of these elders were in fact witnesses to a resurrection. James is mentioned by name, not Peter. If Peter was in fact there, I would think that he would have been mentioned by name as he is supposed to be the leader and would have in fact been a witness, but he is not mentioned. Was he there? We don't know. So who in Jerusalem is a witness? Jerusalem is the biggest city in the country. Trying to find an unknown witness would be a daunting task. Luke's acquaintance with the Jerusalem apostles thus puts him in a position to know what was being proclaimed concerning the nature and variety of the post-resurrection encounters with Jesus. Luke's demonstrated care and meticulousness as an historian also provides some reason, though as we shall see, not our only reason, to think that Luke is sincerely representing what he believes the apostles experienced except we don't even know if any apostles were still in Jerusalem when Paul arrives, since again, none are mentioned by name, except James. James was not an apostle, and we have no record of James having seen a risen Jesus, 
except in the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed. The very creed that we are now trying to establish came from the apostles in Jerusalem. If we know that James saw a resurrected Jesus because of the 1 Corinthians 15 passage, we can't then support that the passage was in fact from a witness just because the Acts passage puts James in Jerusalem. If the point of the argument is to support that the creed came from the apostle witnesses, then the proof that James was in fact a witness can't come from the creed that you are trying to support. Was Luke a traveling companion of Paul? There are too many lines of evidence for Luke being a traveling companion of Paul to discuss in any detail in the present paper. However, I will list a few examples. First, there are the famous we passages, beginning in Acts 16, which are best understood as indicating the author's presence in the scenes he narrates. Craig Keener observes that the we pronouns trail off when Paul travels through Philippi, only to reappear in Acts 20 when Paul passes once again through Philippi. This is suggestive that the author had remained behind in Philippi and subsequently rejoined Paul when Paul returned through Philippi. This is an important point. Was the author of Luke really a companion of Paul? If he was, he would have met the people that Paul met and personally observed the events that he writes of in Acts. The way Acts is written, it does appear to be written by someone who was there on first reading. But there are several aspects of the text that call this into question. Was Luke the companion of Paul the author of this text? According to Bart Ehrman, the name Luke is mentioned three times in the New Testament, Colossians 4.14, 2 Timothy 4.11, and Philemon 24. In all three, Luke is named as a companion of Paul's, but only in the Colossians passage is he called a Gentile, and there he is said to have been a physician. The problem, as some of you may have guessed by now, is that Paul almost certainly did not write either 2 Timothy or Colossians. That means that the only reference to Luke in one of Paul's own writings is in Philemon, where, along with Demas, he is said to be one of Paul's fellow workers, but is not called a Gentile physician. So why should anyone think that this person in particular, of all of Paul's acquaintances, wrote Luke Acts? The key to any discussion of the authorship of Acts is provided by the so-called we passages that occur on four occasions, depending on how one accounts narratives in which the author shifts from third to first person plural narrative. The scholarship on these passages may seem daunting in its scope, but it is even more disheartening in its execution, one suggestion even more implausible than the one preceding. Several full-length studies have been devoted to the question, the most recent by William S. Campbell, but including earlier important contributions by C. Thornton and J. Wernhardt. By far the most surprising aspect of the wee passages, however, apart from their existence at all, is their frequently noted abrupt beginnings and endings. It is their sudden and unexplained disappearance that is most unsettling. When did the author leave the company and for what reason? These and other related problems can be seen in the first of the passages, 16.10-17. through 17. How is it that we included Paul in 16.10 and 11, but then are differentiated from Paul in 1617. That may make sense if an author had wanted to start easing out of the use of the first person plural as a narrative ploy, but it is hard to understand if the narrative is a historically accurate description of a real situation by an author who was there. Moreover, if we were with Paul when he rebuked the spirit-possessed girl, how is it that only Paul and Silas were seized and not we? Did the eyewitnesses leave the company in 1618 suddenly and for no expressed reason? If so, why is he still in Philippi much later in 26? So too in the passages in question, in chapters 20 and 21. Why is the narrative provided in first person when traveling to Miletus, but then shifts to third person once there? Was the author not present for the prayer in verse 36? Why did they not bring us to the ship in 2038? if he sailed with Paul in the next verse? And in the next chapter, why does the author accompany Paul to Jerusalem in 2118 and then disappear without an explanation or a trace in 2119? I will be arguing in what follows that the best explanation for these abrupt beginnings and endings 
is that the first-person pronoun was used selectively to place the author in the company of Paul, thereby authenticating his account. As Burskog expresses the matter, by presenting a narrator who speaks in first-person plural, the author himself appears, albeit vaguely, as present in the arena of history. Clearly, from a narrative point of view, the author is included among the we, and that is sufficient. The we are within the narrative of Acts, historical witnesses to the details and vividness of Paul's words and deeds. Now I want to advance the argument by saying that I don't think the we passages indicate that a companion of Paul wrote Acts, or by inference Luke, because I think there is good counter-evidence to indicate that Acts and Luke were decidedly not written by someone who was familiar personally with Paul. Acts can tell us a great deal about how Luke understood Paul, but less about what Paul himself actually said and did. For discerning the reliability of Acts, we are in the fortunate situation that Paul and Luke sometimes both describe the same event and indicate Paul's teachings on the same issue, making it possible to see whether they stand in basic agreement. What is striking is that in virtually every instance in which the book of Acts can be compared with Paul's letters in terms of biographical detail, differences emerge. Sometimes these differences involve minor disagreements concerning where Paul was at a certain time and with whom. As one example, the book of Acts states that when Paul went to Athens, he left Timothy and Silas behind in Berea and did not meet up with them again until after he left Athens and arrived in Corinth. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul himself narrates the same sequence of events and indicates just as clearly that in fact he was not in Athens alone, but that Timothy was with him, and possibly Silas as well. It was from Athens that he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica in order to see how the church was doing there. It's a minor detail, but it serves to show something about the historical reliability of Acts. The narrative coincides with what Paul himself indicates about some matters. He did establish the church in Thessalonica and then leave from there for Athens, but it stands at odds with him on some of the specifics that might suggest that the author living later knew a few things about Paul's trips, but not the details. Obviously, that is not probative for determining if he was Paul's traveling companion. Other differences are of greater importance. For example, Paul is quite emphatic in the epistle to the Galatians that after he had his vision of Jesus and came to believe in him, he did not go to Jerusalem to consult with the apostles. This is an important issue for him because he wants to prove to the Galatians that his gospel message did not come from Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, the original disciples, and the original church around them, but from Jesus himself. His point is that he has not corrupted a message that he has received from someone else. His gospel came straight from God, with no human intervention. The book of Acts, of course, provides its own narrative of Paul's conversion. In this account, strikingly enough, Paul does exactly what he claims not to have done in Galatians. After leaving Damascus some days after his conversion, he goes directly to Jerusalem and meets with the apostles. It is possible, of course, that Paul himself has altered the real course of events in order to show that he couldn't have received his gospel message from other apostles because he never consulted with them. If he did stretch the truth on this matter, though, his statement in Galatians 1.20 takes on a new poignancy. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie, for in fact, his lie in this case would have been bald-faced. It is probably better then to see the discrepancy as deriving from Luke, whose own agenda affected the way he told the tale. For him, we have seen, it was important to show that Paul stood in close continuity with the views of the original followers of Jesus, because all the apostles were unified in their perspectives. Thus, he portrays Paul as consulting with the Jerusalem apostles and representing the same faith that they proclaimed. And so the big question, would a companion of Paul really not know the sequence of events that Paul considered to be of such vital importance? We could examine other instances of this kind of change, but would perhaps do better to move to the big picture that Luke draws of Paul. 
As we saw in our discussion of Acts, Luke portrays Paul as standing in harmony not only with the original apostles of Jesus, but also with all of the essentials of Judaism. Throughout this narrative, Paul maintains his absolute devotion to the Jewish law. To be sure, he proclaims that Gentiles do not need to keep this law, since for them it would be an unnecessary burden. He himself, however, remains a good Jew to the end, keeping the law in every respect. When he is arrested for violating the law, Luke goes out of his way to show that the charges are altogether trumped up as Paul himself repeatedly asserts throughout his apologetic speeches in Acts, he has done nothing contrary to the law. What about Paul's own writings? Paul's view of the law is extremely complicated. Several points, however, are reasonably clear. First, in contrast to the account in Acts, Paul appears to have had no qualms about violating the Jewish law when the situation required him to do so. In Paul's words, he could not only live like a Jew when it served his purposes, but also like a Gentile, for example, when it was necessary for him to convert Gentiles. On one occasion, he attacked the apostle Cephas for failing to do so himself. In addition, Paul did not see the law as merely an unnecessary burden for Gentiles, something that they didn't have to follow, but could if they so choose. For Paul, it was an absolute and total affront to Gentiles to follow the law, a complete violation of the gospel message. In his view, Gentiles who did so were in jeopardy of falling from God's grace, for if doing what the law required could contribute to a person's salvation, then Christ died completely in vain. This is scarcely the conciliatory view attributed to Paul in Acts. Again, would a companion of Paul really not understand such a crucial feature in his views, one that stood at the very core of his gospel message? Dr. McClatchy makes a few more points on this, which I am skipping, not because they are poor arguments or because I am cherry-picking, but rather because they don't address or overcome the issues that Dr. Ehrman has brought up, and because I think that his section on the resurrection is more important and I want to get to that one before I put you to sleep. If anyone wants me to address the rest of Dr. McGlatchey's arguments for the authorship of Luke Acts being a companion of Paul, leave a comment below and I'll make another video on that subject. Now, on to the big question. Does the author of Luke give us an accurate account of a resurrection of Jesus? An important point here often overlooked is that the accounts of the four Gospels of the women discovering the empty tomb are in fact independent. Luke 24.10 says, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women who told these things to the apostles. It is often suggested that John 21, which reports only Mary Magdalene's discovery of the empty tomb, conflicts with Luke's account. However, in John 22, we read, So she, Mary, ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary's word choice, in particular the use of we do not know, indicates quite incidentally that there were in fact other women, and John's report of these words reveals that he also is aware of this fact, even though it is not mentioned explicitly. Thus, Luke's and John's account of the women discovering the empty tomb appear to be independent of each other. I will grant this as independent sources. While there are parts of Matthew and Luke that are copied verbatim from Mark, indicating that the writers of Matthew and Luke had read and had access to the Gospel of Mark, I would agree that the resurrection portions were written independently and not copied, which will be abundantly clear by their irreconcilable differences. I'm also skipping the discussion on which women were alleged to be present at the empty tomb, as while I agree with skeptics that it's possible to reconcile these differences, a perfect God that is guiding the process of writing the most important narrative in the history of the universe should be able to keep the story more consistent. I also concede that this is not foundational to whether there was or was not a resurrection. Rather, I want to focus on where the apostles were and what they saw or heard in these places, 
as I think these are the nails in the coffin of the empty tomb. Multiple instances of reconcilable variation pertain to the resurrection accounts. For example, it is popularly observed that Luke 24, 36 to 49 reports Jesus as having appeared to the eleven who were all present together at the time. This, so the argument goes, does not allow for Thomas's absence from the group at the time of the appearance, as in John, nor a subsequent appearance to the disciples with Thomas present. Furthermore, John tells us that the appearance to the eleven with Thomas present occurred eight days later, whereas Luke seems to indicate that the ascension took place immediately after the appearance to the eleven. Luke tells us, Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands he blessed them, and while he blessed them he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. One possible reply is that the eleven is being used as a figure of speech, much as the twelve is used that way by Paul. I do not, however, find this approach to be the most convincing, since it seems to be rather ad hoc, and there is no independent evidence that Luke used the term the eleven in this way. It would also not explain the apparent immediacy of Jesus' ascension following the appearance to the eleven, allowing apparently no time for a subsequent appearance to the disciples with Thomas present. In response to this objection, it may be pointed out that at the end of Luke, there is clear haste and lack of specificity about time. Indeed, Luke 24, 29 states that the men on the road to Emmaus pressed Jesus to stay with them for dinner because it was already evening and the day was far spent. We do not know what that means exactly, but it hardly means three in the afternoon. Jesus then goes with them, dinner is prepared, however long that took, and they sit down to eat. They recognize him as he breaks bread and he disappears. Then they immediately go back to Jerusalem, a distance of 60 stadia, which looks like it was about 10 to 12 kilometers, that is about six to seven miles. This walk would take well over an hour, perhaps as long as two hours. Then they chat with the disciples for a while and tell their story. Then Jesus appears and shows himself. They give him some food. Only after this does Jesus begin talking to them about the scriptures, giving them some sort of sermon about how his death was foretold in the scriptures. How long did that take? Jesus then leads them out to Bethany, a mile or two walk. If one tries to put all of this into the same evening, it really looks like it would be dark by that time, making it difficult for them to even witness the ascension into heaven. So even in Luke 24 alone, it does not look like it all happened in one day. Evidently, Luke is either running out of scroll or is in a hurry at that point, and he doesn't appear to have full knowledge yet of exactly how long Jesus was on earth. Thus, he simply leaves it nonspecific and clarifies it in Acts 1. It is popularly alleged that Matthew has Jesus appear to the disciples only in Galilee, not in Judea, and the Gospel of Luke and Acts have Jesus appear to his disciples only in Judea, not in Galilee. I would argue, however, that it is entirely plausible that Jesus' instruction to remain in Jerusalem was said to the disciples after they had returned to the Jerusalem area from Galilee during the 40 days on which Jesus remained on the earth perhaps shortly or even immediately prior to the ascension. By all accounts, the ascension occurred from the region of the Mount of Olives near Bethany, so evidently they went to Galilee and then came back. I would like to begin the analysis by looking at the locations in the order in which the Gospels were written. Mark was written first. What does Mark report as having happened at the tomb? He indicates that some women came, they found an empty tomb, an angel told them that Jesus rose, and they left and told no one. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The remainder of Mark is not in the earliest manuscripts and is not considered by most scholars to be part of the original gospel. This should be game over for Christianity. The women say nothing. No disciples ever even hear about an empty tomb. There are no post-resurrection appearances to anyone. The women saw an angel not a risen Jesus. So what we find in the first story written about Jesus, as far as a resurrection goes, tells us that there were no witnesses to a resurrection. This is what cannot be reconciled with the other gospel accounts. 
If the author of Mark simply stopped here because there was more to the story and other writers merely told the rest of the story, this might make sense if we were discussing an epilogue, but not when we're talking about the climax of the story. It would be like writing a biography of Abraham Lincoln and ending it that he went to a play at Ford's Theater, leaving out that he was shot and killed while he was there. If Paul is correct in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, why leave the story that a couple of women saw an angel and told no one? You have left the story that no one knows about this except a few women. This account cannot be reconciled to the other gospel accounts, and Dr. McClatchy doesn't even attempt to do so. His article never mentions the Gospel of Mark in its attempts to reconcile the resurrection accounts. He only attempts to reconcile Luke with Matthew and John. If his argument would be that Mark just didn't finish the story so it doesn't need to be reconciled, I would wholeheartedly disagree. While you don't need to reconcile details, as there are none, I do think you need to reconcile how, if the Holy Spirit is guiding this process, so that all of these are divine writings, the Spirit would consider it unimportant to include the crux of the story in one of the accounts, particularly the first one ever written. While I will grant that such a reconciliation is possible, it isn't plausible. What is far more likely is that having read the Mark account of the Gospel, the writers of Matthew and Luke further embellish the story by adding post-resurrection appearances. Matthew has the most fantastical accounts of the story, particularly the part about the zombies rising from the graves and walking around Jerusalem just after Jesus dies. This account is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. Dr. McClatchy's claim that many in Jerusalem being witnesses to these events being able to give their accounts to the Gospel writers should have resulted in the story appearing in at least two of the Gospels. If the dead were walking around in the biggest city in the country, you would think that more than one person would have noticed. Dr. McClatchy does not attempt to reconcile the Luke account missing this major event. Next, let's look more closely at Dr. McClatchy's reconciliation of the Judea-Galilee problem. It is also popularly alleged that Matthew has Jesus appear to the disciples only in Galilee, not in Judea, and the Gospel of Luke and Acts have Jesus to appear to the disciples only in Judea, not in Galilee. I would argue, however, that it is entirely plausible that Jesus' instruction to remain in Jerusalem, Acts 1-4, was said to the disciples after they had returned to the Jerusalem area from Galilee, during the 40 days on which Jesus remained on the earth, perhaps shortly or even immediately prior to the ascension. By all accounts, the ascension occurred from the region of the Mount of Olives near Bethany, so evidently they went to Galilee and then came back. Does this fit with the Luke account? Luke 24 begins with the resurrection account, then says that the disciples went to Emmaus that same day. They arrive and return to Jerusalem that same day. They arrive back and Jesus appears to them and tells them to remain in Jerusalem until Pentecost. This is the same day or possibly the next day if night fell and morning came while they were returning. McClatchy argues that the disciples could have gone to Galilee, seen the appearances there that are recorded in Matthew, and then returned to Jerusalem. Jerusalem to Galilee is about three days journey if you go through Samaria, longer if you go around it like most Jewish people did. So while it is possible for the road to Emmaus event to occur, then go to Jerusalem, then the Matthew events to occur, then the John events, and then back to Jerusalem, this is in defiance of the time account given in Luke. Dr. McClatchy ignores the fact that the Luke account has Jesus telling the disciples to remain in Jerusalem in 2449, the same day as he rose or a day later, instead looking at this instruction as only appearing in Acts 1. Dr. McClatchy concludes what best explains the Apostles' claim. When evaluating any claim, three broad categories of explanation must be considered. 
Those are the claimant is deliberately deceiving, the claimant is sincerely mistaken, and three, the claimant is accurately reporting what happened. I would propose a fourth possibility. The gospel writer of Luke heard the stories of what people believed about Jesus and wrote down those stories. Some of those stories coincided with what the writer knew to be in the Mark stories. The writer even copied some of the Mark stories into his work, much like I have copied some of Bart Ehrman's work into mine here. I don't think the writer intended to deceive, nor was he mistaken. These are, in fact, the stories that he heard. However, that doesn't make these stories true, any more than Hans Christian Andersen writing down the Cinderella story accurately as told to him makes that story a historical event. I do think the people that related these stories to the writer believe them to be true. I do think that from the variety of accounts in the Gospels, we can conclude that many people in the first century were talking about this, thus the accounts coming to be written down. But how one would go about determining if the person relating the account to the writer was in fact a witness to the events is impossible to say. I don't think anyone can say with any confidence that whatever unknown source told the unknown writer of the Gospel was a witness to that event. We just don't have enough data to draw such a conclusion. This video is by no means a scholarly work. I claim no formal training in scripture analysis. But if there is a God that expects me to believe that this is a historical event upon which I am supposed to base my entire life and worldview, even a layperson such as myself should be able to read the account and find cohesiveness, but I don't. While I see that it is possible to make parts of the story work to overcome some criticisms, I see it failing to do so with others. But we shouldn't even need to reconcile the accounts. If these are real events, reported by real witnesses directly to the writers who are guided by divine inspiration, we shouldn't need robust apologetics to reconcile and interpret the accounts. I would expect to see minor differences, possibly like the number of women at the tomb, but not major flaws, like one account ending with no post-resurrection appearances, and the timelines of where people are not matching up, and the zombies only appearing in one account. That the story started small in the Mark account and grew to the one in the John account is a far more plausible scenario. A perfect God should have foreseen that this would be an issue for millions and fix the problem before it ever even occurred. Thus, I still find even the Gospels themselves lacking in evidence of a historical resurrection. Live your life.